a lot of them are on traditional code and there's a lot of innovative traditional code, but while in sales, the biggest pain point I saw in the market was affordability. Uh, and affordability is most often connected to speed of development. Uh, the post-production benefit of using no-code, low-code is you don't have to keep your technology clean. Um, so if I'm selling to a corporation, for example, I would say, listen, by rebuilding your CRM system or ERP on no-code, low-code, yeah, you're going to spend more now because we have to rebuild what you already have. But in the long term, you're going to be able to let go of those six to seven guys who aren't really doing anything right now, but you still need to keep them because if you got rid of them and something did happen, you wouldn't know how to fix your, your system. But generally got to Norway. Uh, before long, I was arrested and deported back to uh, back to America. Yeah, welcome to another episode of Digital Executives Hub, and and then and uh, this one is special because uh, we are at Digital Executives Hub. We're gonna be doing things differently now. Uh, I think more entertaining approach to having those those conversations is is better. That's why uh, <laughs> I decided to have the one and only Grady. I, you, you have to you have to say if I'm pressing this, this route, but but I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna do my best. Grady Anderson was that was that proper way of pronouncing first and last name? Grady Anderson, that's okay. correct. You sound you sound way better yes, sir. saying your name than me. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. So so the idea the idea for for today would be um, to get to know Grady, and uh, and also. Talk about uh, technology, because you know, uh, in my opinion, you know, we are growing as 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 humanity just because of we we are adapting more and more uh, technology in 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 our lives. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so great. Uh, but what can we do about it? So, first of all, uh, can you share us uh, share with us, you know, the journey that that you went through? Because uh, we know each other a little bit, but I'm interested uh, about the journey that you went through, but but also where you at right now. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. So, you know, there's, there's a long version with a lot of uh, interesting details. There's the middle version and the short version. Uh, I think I'll I'll go with the middle version, and then you just jump in with comments, and we will we will play off. Sure. But uh, for for those who don't know, uh, I'm an American based in uh, Kiev, Ukraine, and my background is high level networking and sales. It it all got started uh, in real estate. Uh, before I even finished high school, I ended up going to like night school, which was an academy called. Uh, the Arizona Academy of Real Estate and Business. And uh, before I graduated, I got my license to sell residential real estate in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I focused on that for about three years, which uh, transitioned into insurance, specifically legal insurance, uh, which then transitioned into diamonds, which then transitioned into boats, which then transitioned into the digital world. Uh, and this is where I kind of understood what is the idea of being able to get on a, a Skype call or a Zoom call and actually discuss digital services with somebody. And this was actually a, a big transition for, for me in my not only personal life, but career, because this is around when I also moved to Ukraine, like late 2017, early 2018. And when I got to Kiev, I saw a really, really interesting opportunity in the CIS market. So uh, for those who don't know, CIS is just like post-Soviet. Easiest way to kind of uh, uh, describe it. And I started my first sales consulting firm, Pavdi. Uh, we started out here in Ukraine, but we, we very quickly started finding clients in Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Turkey, Moldova, Poland, etc., and the specialty was helping 
IT consulting and development companies expand into the US and Canada through partnership acquisition campaigns, affiliate acquisition campaigns, and client acquisition campaigns. And, you know, I love sales. So it was always something I really enjoyed, but I got burnt out. You, you know, Paul, sales <laughs> no, is I'm tough. I'm going strong. I love and, sales. And... It's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to get tired of it. So I don't know what you mean. <laughs> and the, the, the hardest part for me was the multiple brands aspect. Even though all my clients had basically the same service, you know, custom software design and development, and ver- it just varied in niche, varied in approach, varied in price, varied in mentality, varied in market, etc. And that got really emotionally draining. Uh, it got really tiring. And I started looking for my way out. And when you start looking for your way out, you... If you're aware enough, you realize, okay, something's wrong. You know, you know, something about the situation isn't isn't right. So I actually ended up closing Pavity. And while thinking about, you know, what do I want to do? Why do I want to do it? I, I visualized my experience for the last five years, uh, six-ish years, I guess we can say, actually, and. I decided that I shouldn't leave IT consulting and development because I had built such a powerful network in that sphere all around the world. And I know there was a lot of opportunity there. However, what I did decide to do is open up my own IT consulting and development firm. And I say firm instead of agency, and we can get into that, into that later. Uh, But my USP, my unique selling proposition was going to be no code, low code. Uh, I saw it as a blue, a blue ocean opportunity. You know, there was, you could close your eyes, throw a rock and hit some kind of IT consulting and development uh, company offering some kind of custom services or non-custom services, whatever it is. But a lot of them are on traditional code and there's a lot of innovative traditional code, but while in sales, the biggest pain point I saw in the market was affordability. Uh, and affordability is most often connected to speed of development or approach to development, which is then just another way of looking at how fast you, you develop it. And there were so many great people who I spoke to with really exciting ideas, but not enough money to to realize. If, if I if I may, because you're actually talking about uh, something that I, I guess it's kind of it became kind of obvious that. Custom work, custom software development became so ridiculously expensive. It's just, it's insane these days, right? Uh, that, um, yeah, that, that I just wonder is, is the no code, low code solutions, are they the answer, you know, to still deliver the value to, to clients, but don't uh, break the bank? For sure. Uh, like, let, let's frame it in, in a way. I would say no code, low code solutions. I, I separate them no code and low code because they're definitely different, uh, but usually they're packaged together in some way, shape, or form. We're in generation three, some may argue generation four of no code, low code. So I would say in eight out of 10 cases, you can build the same thing you would build with hard code on no code, low code. You know, whether we're talking about a comprehensive internal tool or a comprehensive sauce tool. There's, of course, limitations in no code, low code in general, but each technology also has its own limitations, similar to hard code uh, technologies, libraries, frameworks, uh, scripts, uh, etc. But in general, you can come to me, tell me your idea. And there's a 90, 80 to 90 percent chance that we're going to be able to realize it on No Code Rebels' tech stack. And there's a lot of no code tech stacks out there, but we we stick to WeWeb for the front end and Xano for for the back end. Uh, there's just a lot more pros to these two uh, technologies, especially as a pair, than cons. So. We decided, you know, that's where we're going to specialize. That's what we're going to focus on. And that's how we're going to uh, uh, consolidate our approach. 
I have to I have to ask about um, what's possible with no no code low code solution because I, I don't really believe this is the answer to to you know all the questions, but I strongly believe it's becoming more and more uh, you know adaptable and and more and more there's more and more things that are possible now because like you said there are different generations of 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 low code no code solutions so what would be uh what are the main benefits but but if we can be clear and frank <laughs> what are the down what, what's the downside of 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 implementing low code no code solutions so those two topics if you can uh, if you can elaborate that would be great I, I can I can give you the sales and marketing pitch about the pros and cons, or I can go with more of the technical pros and cons. No technical uh, today. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's not technical. Uh, so uh, let's let's start with maybe just even our our real cases. It'll probably be easier to talk about real projects versus try to create some fantasy examples. But we can go into that if we if we wanted to. So No Code Rebels mostly focuses right now on startups. Uh, and these are typically guys that have cool ideas, but never really had the budget to be able to do it on hard code. Uh, they also typically lack a lot of technical and in some cases business prowess. So it, it's really just an idea and our team has to go through the proper business analysis to, to shape it up. But uh, some of the projects that we've done, uh, fix a contract it. So this is a Swedish based, uh, company and they're a real estate platform. Uh, you can, you can call it like an aggregator of various rental properties available in Stockholm. And the, the idea of this tool is it, it scrapes the internet looking for, uh, recent uploads from landlords for new availability. It takes that. Uh, information, pushes it into the system, we clean it, and then on the interface side, what a client is actually able to do is look at it similar to they would look at almost any other real estate platform. You can kind of search by square meter, location, uh, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, etc. And what this platform is going to do is, because it's so competitive in Stockholm, uh, sometimes people are waiting for years to get into some of these neighborhoods. The main idea is the system finds the property, uploads the property to the system, and then checks all of the people who are interested in a property like this, and then sends them a text message with a link to apply on the landlord's website. Uh, as soon as something meets their their requirements, no matter what time of day it happens to find uh, this information. And then users just pay a monthly uh, uh, subscription to remain a part of this of this ecosystem. Yep. Here. Makes perfect sense. And uh, I, I mean, it sounds like a, I'm not going to say easy, but it's like an obvious uh, solution. Let's say that you, that what is the benefit of, of, of using low code, no code, no code solution versus just regular? The price? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. The, to, Two reasons. Two reasons right? Everything comes down to price. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the end, it's price. Okay. No matter which avenue we want to go around, it, it comes down to price. The more the more obvious one is uh, development time. Most outsourcing agencies or freelancers are going to charge per hour. Right. In in most cases, I would say it's actually pretty rare to find somebody who's charging on a value yeah. basis in in this industry, anyways. Uh, so. By cutting down the time of development, both on the front and back end, you naturally reduce the the cost of the the application. Typically, I would say uh, if we're looking for an MVP, uh, I would say most of the time it's between five hundred to a thousand hours to get what you're looking for. If we're looking for something uh, more comprehensive, it's anywhere from fifteen hundred to three thousand hours. But honestly. Going more than 3,000 hours, you're getting into a really comprehensive uh, product, which is what, not what most of the market is looking for, unless it's a rebuild, which is a completely different you know, use case, business case of the approach to developing something. The second one, uh, which is uh, as powerful, but typically on the sales process, 
not what people are starting the conversation with. It's it's post production. So uh, the post production benefit of using no code, low code is you don't have to keep your technology clean. Um, so if I'm selling to a corporation, for example, I would say, listen, by rebuilding your CRM system or ERP on no code, low code, yeah, you're going to spend more now because we have to rebuild what you already have. But in the long term, you're going to be able to let go of those six to seven guys who aren't really doing anything right now, but you still need to keep them because if you got rid of them and something did happen, you wouldn't know how to fix your your system. Wow. Sorry to interrupt, but that's super interesting. Like most applications, they need maintenance, right? So so first of all, you have the de de development phase and then you have to have somebody to, you know, keep an eye on it and maintain it. And and, and, and that's that's also expensive. With no code, low code solution, like the, the maintenance is not required. Can you explain that? Maintenance is definitely required, but because, so what, you know, What's the technical term for no code, low code? It's visual coding. So it's the drag and drop aspect, but people don't really like the drag and drop sound. It sounds cheap, but it's, it, it's not, it's pretty comprehensive. But because it's set up like that, both on the front end and the back end, it allows it to be much easier to be maintained. Meaning say one guy could do both the front end and the back end by himself. Now, if it's going to be a small project, you might not even need him full time. You could keep him part time just to to come in and take a look at things when something buggy is happening or keep him full time if you want to continue to add features over a period of time. But a lot of our clients actually just don't even have a technical team. The business analyst or the uh, uh, content marketer becomes responsible for maintaining the uh, technical solution. And they can do this because with a little technical interest and a little workshop, let's say 10 to 20 hours of you know practice and understanding, you you know what you're working with here because it's a builder. You know, it's all of them are constructed like builders. I just I just realized there's another benefit that just, just came to my mind because because we we're, we're talking like I often see that uh let's say there is some legacy system or whatever just just a, just 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 uh just an application that, that that has been built five years ago a year whatever and then usually when we ask like the other uh you know developers to take a look at it and maybe take it over take over the development or just maintenance they need months sometimes to understand you know what was the other developer thinking what was he thinking when 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 he wrote this code how is that affecting everything else? So what you're saying with with a low code, no code solution is like you can you can just take over uh, easily. Like you, you don't have because because there is no personalization that was done by 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 certain developer with certain skin skill set and certain way of thinking, right? Can 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 you elaborate that? Because that that's super interesting. Cause, that's uh, yeah. it's. It's a tricky area. Okay. Uh, it, so in general, yes, that's true. But in reality, uh, the biggest problem I would say in no code, low code is its biggest benefit. So what is a citizen developer? I don't know if you've ever heard of this, of this term before, but basically it's a non-tech. The whole no code revolution is built off this idea. A citizen developer. So this is a non-technical person taking on a technical job. Uh, so, uh, and at first, when we first started running No Code Rebels, we were fully in the No Code Revolution philosophy, and that's who we hired. You know, teachers who became developers, police officers who became developers. But we we saw one crucial problem in this, and that's. Uh, that's foundation, a foundational understanding of computer science and systems architecture. So even though you can build something much easier with visual coding, uh, it doesn't mean it's going to work. Uh, so you still have to understand how a solution works theoretically and in practice to make sure it works how it's supposed to work for as long as it's supposed to work 
with as little as bugs uh, as possible. And most cases in the no code world, that's really what you're seeing is the, you know, the grocery guy or the police officer who becomes a developer spends three months on your project and it doesn't work at the end because he actually has no understanding of how it's supposed to work in theory as a foundational understanding. So to answer your question, will we come back to a situation uh, where it's a legacy no-code project from another developer? If it's built properly, it shouldn't be an issue because you're able to just you know understand logically how this kind of system should have uh, been built in the first place. But if it's just some kind of guy who came in there like a cowboy and just started throwing stuff together, uh, most likely it'll be the same problem as in a traditional development where we're just going to say, listen, let's restart from scratch. You know, like that's that's what we're going to have to do in, in this sort of uh, situation because because it's blocks, changing one thing actually changes big chunks of it. And sometimes it's just easier to just carve it out and, and get in there and redo it from a from a better approach, a better methodology. Okay, great. I do have some other questions, but uh, but I want to change the topic uh, for you know uh-huh. a couple minutes because I since I have you here, I I, I want to find out about um, what kind of potential uh, you know do you see in those uh, low code no code solutions, and how do you see the future now? Uh, for companies that are already adopting those those uh, you know low code low code solutions, and then do you think the switch between custom software and then low code low code solution you know is happening? It's happening too slow. It's happening at the right pace. It's happening too fast. W- w- what do you think about the future? Like, what are we experiencing right now? Because there is a lot of talks about low code no code solution, but on the other hand. Most companies are still using uh, just a regular, uh, regular development. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say, so just full transparency, I'm all in. You know, I've put all my chips into the, the no-code, low-code bag when I started no-code rebels. Uh, so I, I'm all in and, and I see the future is there and it's getting better and better, you know, every day even. Uh, is it happening too slow? Is it happening too fast? How is it happening? Uh, I would say it's happening pretty quickly, uh, but it's still one of those blue ocean areas where a lot of people just don't know what it is, or when they hear it, they think of Wix. So Wix is, it is a no-code uh, solution, but it's for websites, not applications. And I think that's in, in the market, at least from an understanding perspective, especially in sales, or HR, because sometimes you want to hire people to be a no-coder, but they have this this stereotype of what uh, no-code actually is. That's probably the hardest block to get over is what is it actually, and is it good or bad? Uh, so so there's no clear... You, you see, because I don't see a lot of it, maybe because this is not my main focus, right? But But you do see a lot of those implementations and you see, you know, companies... You know, reaching out and and and, and like if it, okay, so if they do, what is their motivation? Like, because you just mentioned several benefits of of you know of implementing low code no code solution, but what are the companies thinking? What are they thinking when they reach out to you and they say, "We heard about low code no code. We don't know if it's for us, or or they already know it's gonna be maybe more agile, maybe." Uh, cheaper, maybe the implementation time is going to be shorter. What is the current market thinking about low code, no code? Uh Let's separate the market from like startups and corporations because they definitely think and approach it differently. I would say for corporations, it's happening much slower or they don't even know they're getting a low code solution. Their IT vendor is just giving it to them without like Right. This is a no-code, low-code solution. Right. You know, so they don't even know what's happening in most cases. But for the, for the startups, uh, they're definitely looking for it. And what are they looking for? They're looking for uh, affordability. Uh, and when they find it, they usually find Bubble. So Bubble is kind of like the Hulk 
of no code, low code. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, it's not the oldest, but it definitely has the biggest market share in terms of brand. You know, almost everybody, when you start your search, you find bubble and then you expand your horizons from bubble. Uh, same thing with no code rebels. We started with bubble, but just found what I would say is more technically beneficial uh, solutions. But these guys are usually low budget. So if you get into no code right now and, and you're just looking for what are most people looking for, it's the low budget guys with less than $20,000 looking for a comprehensive solution. Uh -huh. So there are quite a bit of calls that don't turn into anything because uh, a, a lot of times they don't, they don't actually even understand their own idea. Like they don't, they don't have preparation on the business model side, preparation on the marketing side. They don't really even know how it works. They just say, this is my idea. And then once we start talking about it, we, we, we try to fit within a budget, a solution that meets most of their potential needs. And what happens a lot of times on our side is we have to spend time helping them understand their business model. Like spend time understanding, okay, so if we build this, what are you going to do with it? You know, like who do you want to target with it? And a lot of times they don't even know who they want to target uh, with it. So that's rough. And not everybody has the patience or the desire to work with this, this kind of, uh, this kind of client. But if you do, there's a lot of them because the low budget space is a big space to be in. Okay. Um, yeah, this is like, I, I wanted to talk about other things as well, but since we're talking, I understood that this low code, no code space is so fascinating, you know? I mean, this conversation is interesting for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like 20 something minutes that, that, that we are talking about low code, no code, but, uh, we're still just on the surface. We are, we are. And, and then I had other plans, you know, for this conversation, but I just, I want to know more. Right, because mm -hmm. if I'm that's interested good. in that's usually a good yeah, sign. Yeah, if I'm interested, uh, uh, you know, in getting uh, some more information about it, maybe some other people, you know, watching or listening, because for me, you know, I I do IT, I do know ID, IT industry fairly well, but still, this is something that that I was not like in touch with, you know, before, right? And then and that's that, that, I think that's what makes it super super interesting. To me, uh, especially agility, you know, I, I, I just, I just think that sometimes if you are developing five hundred thousand uh, dollar application, maybe one million dollar application, uh, you basically spend, I don't know, a year, maybe two years developing something, and you are not sure if if it's gonna work at the end. You can kind of, you know, do some testing and, and, and you can find out that, you know, certain milestones are delivered, but for you to understand that the whole application works, it can take two years before, before you can actually test the whole complex, uh, solution. How is, um, how is low code, no code, uh, approach, uh, dealing with, uh, MVPs? Like, like how is it, is it, is it, <laughs> I mean, we have, we can, we can do like minimal, minimal, uh, valuable uh, products, um, with just regular, uh, you know, coding skills, but is, is, um, low code, no code solutions, are they better or easier? The, 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 like the ROI is, 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 is better, or you can, you can just figure out if what you want to achieve, you can figure out that, you know, faster, cheaper. I just I need to and I I like to understand that especially uh, for the uh, MVPs. I think that's a beautiful question, and I have two feelings about it. You know, one feeling is just yeah the practicality, and then another feeling is the uh, opportunity there. So uh, to touch on both of it quickly before I go into detail on it, what what, what I see is from a marketing perspective and a desire perspective. The easiest way to understand no code, low code is the MVP approach. In some cases, a max VP approach around specific functionality. But generally, 
the biggest understanding in people with budget, so people who are serial entrepreneurs, they're not the low budget guys, but they do know about no code, low code. They're looking to justify their idea before transitioning into their traditional tech stack. Uh, so they come to us, they say, Grady, you know, uh, this is what I want to see happen. Show me that happen so that I can go and develop it further in, in a hard code environment. So uh, I would say 90 to 95% of projects use the word MVP. Like they say, hey, you know, I want to test this idea. I want to see what can we do with this, which is great. You know, it is, it's, it's one of the best ways to make sure that your idea is actually a good idea. You can actually onboard your users. But I would say as an enthusiast in no code and somebody who put my, you know, all of it into it, it's not just for MVPs. And I would argue that there's a lot of tools that can be built on no code and stay on no code in some cases uh, forever and perform exactly how they're supposed to be. Because, you know, the, the the tools that cost millions of dollars and take two years don't always actually have to take millions of dollars and take two years because if we look at how much of that is actually productive development, it's a pretty small portion, I would say. A lot of it is mostly bureaucratic discussions back and forth, a lot of comprehensive business analysis, maybe quality assurance testing, uh, it, it's at meetings, et cetera, et cetera, which... which accumulate quite a bit of cost and then no code it's it's more straightforward you know we're we're usually more ready to jump in and get it done because of the mindset of the developers as well so i guess yeah speed is it's not just the mvp thing it's the speed mindset of everybody in no code so why does somebody want to buy it because it's fast why does somebody want to do it because it's fast so the, the benefit here is both parties agree that speed is the primary value, which which creates affordability. Okay. The, the, you went deep uh, into explaining that, um, but uh, I'm like everybody else. I need and want simple simple answers <laughs> because, you know, it's like everybody, <laughs> everybody wants low-hanging fruits. Everybody wants uh, simple answers. Everybody wants... Yeah. Uh, the ROI uh, to be a thousand percent, and and they need it tomorrow, right? So, so I, I will be asking questions. Then you know, if if you can, uh, you know, give us uh, simple, Either. short, sweet Check answers. That would be uh, that would be awesome. that would be awesome. Yeah, this is uh, I learned this about people. You know, <laughs> being being in sales Either. for years, <laughs> I know what they what they are expecting. Nobody wants to you know listen that this is gonna be challenging. Everybody wants to hear this is going to be easy and it's going to be ready by tomorrow. Yeah. So um, you mentioned... <laughs> Not quite that fast. Yeah. But, but generally fast. Yeah. yeah. So um, you also mentioned that at the beginning of of, uh, of, your, of, of the recent uh, company that, 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 you, that you've established, you, are, uh, you were hiring people that were enthusiastic, but maybe they were not, you know, like super... Um, uh, they didn't have a, a great, uh, you know, like IT background. Uh, and then you said that was, that, that, that kind of re re required recalibration and, 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 and you understood that this background is, is uh, required there. So let's say that um, there are people that are thinking about becoming uh, aspiring developers, right? So, so they're thinking about, ah, if low code, no code, um, it's maybe, maybe, I don't know. I'm just guessing maybe easier to learn, you know, than just t regular typical coding. Uh, what kind of advice would you give them? Like what they should be focusing on if they're really thinking of, of, of getting into this, uh, uh, low code, no code, uh, development. I would say, try to understand what your, your own goals are, uh, financially and lifestyle wise, because a lot of developers have it really comfortable in the hard code world, big salaries, I would say low expectations in, in a lot of cases and a lot of extra money. In, in the no code space, the, just the type of people 
that you're going to be communicating with are a little bit more on edge. They're more about saving money. They're more about proving concepts as fast as possible. So the, the idea is you have to want that. You know, if you want that, then no code, low code is a good direction for you to go. And how to get started. Uh, I, I would just say, you know, go to Bubble or whatever no code, low code solution that you've heard of already. I use WeWeb and Xano. And then just start playing around with the academy. So the, the cool thing about a lot of these is they have templates. So you can just pick the, I don't know, the CRM template. And it'll just automatically throw you in there without you having to pay for anything. And you can just experience it on the front end and on the back end. And then you'll know pretty quickly if you're already a relatively decent developer, like what the potential is for you in that sphere. Okay. That was supposed to be sweet and simple. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It was, it was, good. <laughs> was, that, it was, one, good. was that one more complicated? It was good. <laughs> You know, the best, the okay. best, the best answers okay. are yes and no, and you'll be, it's, it's going to be great. Uh -huh. I promise it's going to be great. <laughs> no, but, but that was, that was, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. that was a good answer. And then um, now I'm thinking to ask about kind of a summary of, of what you went through, you know, because you, under, you, you were a part of just, you know, regular um, software development. Reg I don't know if I'm calling this right. I don't, I don't know how to call the regular stuff of the development. I just say traditional. Traditional, yeah. So I say traditional. So, so you knew the yeah, traditional, yeah, yeah. Um, or you still know that the tr traditional way of developing software. And now you have, you know, learned and 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 you got excited about no code, low code solutions. Uh, what kind of like important lessons have you learned uh, during this switch? Or uh, you know, when when. I know it's, it's it's kind of you know asking about maybe the benefits, but but maybe not. Maybe there are things that are not super obvious. And I I, I know that if you want to know the benefits of low code low code solution, you can Google it. But what what interests me is uh, your perspective. How it was changing? You know, when you was switching from traditional software development uh, to uh, low code low code uh, development. That's right. Should I speak to owners of IT development agencies who are thinking about introducing it, or should I speak to developers who would want to start learning? Um, who is your uh, ICP? <laughs> I would talk. I would talk to people that potentially are, yeah. are you know, like interested because wanting to implement it. I, I would. I would focus on that. I mean, it, it's, a, it's. Let's just talk about it because it, it, it just it just makes sense. Uh, cause I'm guessing there might be like IT uh, directors or people that, that are involved in, um, in, in running, uh, you know, IT teams supporting corporations, smaller companies, startups, whatever. And maybe they, they are thinking about, uh, the way the, the, the traditional software development is supporting companies, but maybe they're not thinking, maybe they're not ready for this change, you know, to be actually implementing uh, low-code, low-code solutions. And they, sh they should hear what has changed for you, you know, since, since you knew the traditional way and now you're excited. What, what, what's, what's there? What, what was the, like, the process of transitioning from, from one to another? Brazil. Um, <laughs> to be 100% yes no. honest... Yeah, the Without. question, the, the answer that we like is yes and no, and it's going to be yes great. No. It's going to be ready by tomorrow. Maybe. <laughs> exactly. Uh, honestly, I went through a lot of pain in this transition. I don't, I don't want to say that that's what everybody has to go through, but when you don't necessarily have somebody to guide you, there was a lot of pain. Because like I said, I started with the, uh, with the citizen developer approach no computer science background and it was really hard an uncountable number of problems in every phase of that of that approach and and what i realized the biggest benefit of no code is is not really what the hype is about about this anybody can code anybody can develop it's is that people who already know how to code who already know how to develop 
can come in and build cooler things faster and more efficiently that are more sustainable over X period of time. So if you already know what you're doing, it's a tool that's going to propel you forward much faster. If you don't know what you're doing, I would still honestly say learn how to hard code, then go to no code. Wow. It sounds weird, but uh, but if you if you don't have that foundational computer science abilities, the likelihood of you building junk is very high, even though it's easier to build the junk. I did not so I did not expect that's, that. That's what I would say. Yeah, I I, I was being, yeah, I wasn't expecting it either, <laughs> but that's really what I learned. That's that's that sounds like a super honest uh, answer. You know, because you're not just praising yeah. low code, low code solutions. That oh, this is so good. I I love it because you know I'm experiencing. You know, like we both know no sales, and very often salespeople are not honest. You know, and they 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 just tell you what you want to hear, basically, even if it's not true. But that was that was that was good. That was a really good answer. You know, so you're not. That's, you that's, the, that's the best way I, I see it. it. It's an enabler, uh, and that's and that's what it is. And it enables people who already know what to do to do it better. Okay, that's that's Great. what it's for. The I wanted to ask you about uh, you moving uh, to Kiev, whatever years ago, five, six, six or years, I, I believe, right? Do you mind if we if we yeah. if we kind of talk about the motivation yeah. for, for moving let's, to Kiev. I've been there. It's great. What, 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 what's your motivation? Uh, it's far away from home. Uh, that's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> do, do, you, do you want me to be uh, honest uh, or shape it up a little uh, bit? Yes, no. And, and it's going to be ready by tomorrow. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I, it's totally up to you. I really, really appreciate if you're and honest. We're, I really appreciate if Joe you're honest. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and if you're ready, that this message will spread, right? There's probably some people that will hear what you're saying right now. So, take that in consideration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll definitely take it in consideration. I'm a pretty open book. So, uh, one of the reasons why I came to Keith. So, uh, I'm more on the right side of politics. And in America, it became very difficult to listen to people talk about stuff that was. Very interesting for me to discuss, but usually they can't handle it and they don't want to use facts. They want to like focus on emotions, even if it doesn't really make sense because I'm more logical. I'm like, okay. And sometimes I even try to agree with them and negotiate against myself and then they still can't uh, understand it in a lot of cases. And, you know, when, when Trump was first running for president, it was like, it was like 2000. 16 or something like this, 2015, 2016. Uh, I started to get much more deeper involved in this. And this is where I realized we started, I started to have a lot of problems. A lot of problems like uh, with people I went to school with, a lot of problems with my family, a lot of problems with business. And finally, I just decided like, wow, let's just get away from this. Like, let's just stop talking about this completely. And I started thinking about where I wanted to go. And first I went to Norway. Uh, long story on how I went to Norway. We'll skip all the details there. But but generally got to Norway. Uh, before long, I was arrested and deported back to, uh, back to America. Uh, so my whole idea of staying in Norway was very, very short, <laughs> short-lived. <laughs> and I found myself in... <laughs> Virginia, which is not where I'm from, my whole world was kind of like flipped upside down. And I was, thought I was going to live in Norway, have a family there and, and all of this kind of stuff. And I felt like I was like even farther back than square one uh, being in Virginia. And I started thinking like, okay, you know, what the heck do I want to do? Why do I want to do it? And this is where I started learning about Ukraine and just Eastern Europe. Uh, and again, it was still to get away from all of the like American style politics and, and things like this. And I would even say like, I would even say Western and Central European politics as well. It's still very like socially orientated than economically orientated and things like this. So I decided, okay, you know, let's, let's check out Eastern Europe. Uh, 
And just their their views were very interesting to me because they're still pretty isolated, like in, in Ukraine, like before, you know, before nobody even really knew about Ukraine, there were still foreigners there, but nothing like in other European countries. So it, it felt very calm. The only politics they really talked about was like the stuff between them and Russia. It was like, that's all they talked about, which is important for them, definitely. But for me, it was it was just like some something that I can't relate to in in a lot of cases. Sure. So that was the reason for you to to go there, right? What's the reason for you to stay? Yeah. It's a great question. Uh, I would say I learned to love it. You know, I became very very comfortable in Kiev, in in good ways, in a positive way. I I felt that the city has a vibe that's very homey. Uh, my favorite aspect actually is the tea coffee culture of Ukraine, like restaurant business in Ukraine. I find much more enjoyable than uh, the places I've been in Europe and in Central Asia. Uh, they take they take it very seriously. Same, th- same as they take like fashion very seriously. Uh, whether you're you know, on the lower income side, upper income side, you know, this how people look at you is really important for them. And I value that. For me, that's, that's interesting because everybody tries to be the best that they can or at least look like they're doing the best that they can in, in various areas where, you know, in America, it's like you can go out in your pajamas, like sure. not even do your hair <laughs> and stuff like this. And it's, it's rough for me. I like it when everybody's performing. Everybody wants to be a winner, or at least try. Yeah, uh, yeah. To be, yeah, be a yeah, yeah. So yeah. I like, I like you, that. You, you, you will meet the, uh, you know, p- people wearing pajamas, just just casually shopping at the supermarket. You know, going to the gas station. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's there's a lot of things that people don't realize, I guess, about. <laughs> the US, but but that, that's it, just it's one not thing. bad. It's just it's just different. Not yeah, my it's, style. It's, it's different. It's casual to the max. I would say. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you can be more casual than that. <laughs> Very. Um, yeah. So, you know, considering your broad experience, you know, you've been, you know, living in different countries, you get arrested regularly, right, and then get gets deported back to to the US. <laughs> That's one of the hobbies that you have. Yeah, yeah. That, that's fun. That sounds like fun. Uh, so, with all that experience, living in different countries, running different, uh, you know, companies, you know, having international relationships, this is this is this is pretty big, right? In in, in different countries, having customers, uh, in, in different uh, countries all over the world. What is this um, one advice that you would give to yourself? Uh, to your younger self, let's say, yeah. One advice that you would give to your younger self, uh, and 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 maybe, yeah, you just you just do whatever you want with this question. This is the question that I that I wanted to know because uh-huh. I have okay. those things that that I like to talk about and th- those things that I have, I have, I have seen and learned and grown so much from um, from. Mistakes, of course. You, 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 don't, you don't learn if you do things correctly. You learn if you make mistakes. And I know what I would uh, what I would say to myself twenty years ago. What is that for you? For me, it's it's actually the same thing I have to tell myself every single day running the the company now. It's you know, people are your engine. Just find the best people the first time, and. And for me, it's really as simple as that. People is everything. Have the best people in your network, the best friends, the best employees, the best partners, because I can't even count how many problems could be avoided if the right people were on the team the first time. So that that would be my advice for sure. People first approach, right? That that do, I, 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 I do agree, but... Um... I, I don't think all, most companies are understanding this the way that you that you said it because I understand is exactly what what uh, what I think that people should come first and I think that one person that I, that's actually talking about it is is Richard Branson you know this famous quote of his that you know 
put your employees first. You know, it's not the customer centric, customer first approach. It's to make sure your your people are are right, and they're gonna make sure that your customers are are doing fine. So yeah, that that's just I think the only person that 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 is not saying f- make sure that the customer service is best. Make sure your people are good, and they will treat your customers you know uh, accordingly. And then, as a summary, like a, like a, like I wanna to summarize uh, you know everything that we talked about today, but also look at uh, at the plans of your of your future plans, like with everything that you that you went through, yeah, everything that you went through, and just just you know we, we spoke about low code, no code. We spoke about your background. Oh, we spoke about the fact that you are uh, living in Kiev right now. And you love it, <laughs> and and so there was very many different elements of you know advantages disadvantages of low code low code no code solutions. What are your plans for the future? You know, considering um, the uh, considering what you're doing, which is you know implementing low code no no code solutions. What's out there for you in the nearest twelve months? Let's say. I really like this question. <laughs> uh, 12 months is hard to gauge will it happen or not happen, but generally the rough idea is uh, expansion. So this is going to be business, business focus, expansion through franchise. So the main thing that I'm trying to do is set up the legal architecture for no code rebels uh, to be uh, franchised. Uh, So what that means is my new, what I want my approach to be is making more offices while my offices are focusing on building no code software. Uh, and I think the most short term right now, other than just enhancing the, the key of team is, uh, setting up a Lagos, Nigeria office. We're already in discussions with some, uh, a few it companies that are kind of right now battling for which one gets to take the no code rebels, uh, name. And then also in Kishinev, of Moldova, we, we have an opportunity to open an office there. So those three offices are the main things I'm trying to focus on as a professional and just make sure that it's, uh, this will be the, the first time I take a super uh, official approach to how my business is set up, you know, from a legal perspective, an accounting perspective, uh, corporate culture perspective, training material perspective, shared services perspective. Uh, so it's a big endeavor for me. Kind of scary in some ways when I'm talking to the franchise lawyer saying all of these things that like I have no idea about, I have to consider with IP and things like this, blah, blah, blah. But but overall, uh, very exciting uh, and a challenge I'm ready to try and take on. Nice. Uh... You know, discomfort is good, you know, just being outside of your comfort zone, you know, making those kind of decisions. This is the only way you grow. You're never going to grow your company or yourself if you don't uh, take on those uh, those challenges. Beautiful. Beautiful. That was that was good. Like, this is something that I I, I, I realize every time I, I, I you know, I, I do one of those episodes. It's like, there's so much knowledge, so much potential, so much interesting energy, so much insights in every single uh, conversation that I have. So I want to thank you for you know for being here, and then being a part of this. This thank you for having <laughs> me. I appreciate this it. episode. Absolutely, it was it was good. Um, yeah, I just I the the summary of this episode is everything that, that I'm not gonna even try to to, to do it now. Uh, because sure. it was, there's a lot of trying. <laughs> it was so good. Um, it was you know so good. Some of the some of the answers were a little long and complicated, but that's okay. <laughs> Just kidding, no, because you know what people expect: <laughs> easy and fast and stuff like that. Very, so, very um, nice. it, it, beautiful. Um, I think uh, I think I want to wrap it up, but but I do have I do have one one, one last question. Uh, is there any like success stories uh, of uh, no no code rebels that that you could share? Uh, you know, just 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 a story of a I don't know relationship implementation. 
just 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 to, just something that 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 we can just throw out there uh to give an example sure. of of you know how you work with uh with people and how you work with with, with companies would you share one i'll, I'll stick it I'll stick it to a human to human uh, aspect. Uh, like I said, you, people are our engine. I would say the most exciting and successful uh, thing No Code Rebels has done, in, in my opinion, in terms of project basis, is uh, our work in the Japanese market. It actually sounds uh, a little bit crazy, <laughs> but for a long time, I've known a Japanese IT consultant. Uh, when I moved to Ukraine, and we've like been friends, we like go to the pool together, drink together, and things like this, but we never really did any business together. But when he really started to notice, No Code Rebels was was kicking off. You know, his job is selling IT uh, to and from J- Japan. Uh, he he saw that we were doing some cool things, uh, and we started talking. And he brought uh, one of his Japanese investors to a conversation. And we managed to get two projects uh, kicked up at the same time. One is like no code AI, which is another whole. That's another world episode, of really, that we, we, that we, we gonna have in the, we're gonna have in the future. <laughs> yeah. No code AI. This yeah, let's, is I, let's do it. <laughs> I want it. I wanted. I wanted to know because this is, this is like <laughs> let's schedule <it> now. <laughs> and uh, uh, and that project is called Maku. Uh, in short, it's it's. It's basically a a chat bot with uh, a messaging app that they have in Japan called Line, and it allows uh, Japanese people to learn about Ukrainian culture. So there's there's 40 different personas based on Ukrainian real Ukrainian students at the Lviv University of Business, um, and they and it, they can just chat with these AIs to learn about Ukrainian history, politics, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then another one is. Uh, Imagine if Twitter and Nine Gag got together and had a baby. Uh, it's a it's a closed it's a closed uh, community in a social media format for uh, Japanese uh, stock professionals. So closed closed community for Japanese stock professionals. Imagine a Twitter experience, uh, and both of those projects are are happening simultaneously, and will be closing like at the beginning of uh, December. And there's already talks about more Japanese projects to to take on. So that's what we're, we're really excited about right now at Nokia. Yeah. Now I feel like sushi, you know, after after all this, um, after all this talk. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was, it was, it was Literally. really good. Like I, I, it was, it was like, it was comfortable. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I felt, I felt comfortable. I don't know what, what you felt during this um, conversation, but it was good. It was I felt good. A little bit of everything, you know, with uh, focus yeah, yeah. and big, big focus on technology, which is, you know, always important here. So thank you very much. Any Anything else that you'd like to, you know, add or something that I I was going to ask, but I didn't ask about some something to share with the, with the world and the YouTube community? I would just say, like this is speaking to salespeople uh, directly. I'm not sure how many of them actually are following your, your, your channel, but really take that, that human to human thing to heart because whether you have a system in place or not, what you need is the right people by your side supporting you along the way because those people are going to open doors and those doors usually have money on the other side of them. And that's initially what we're all trying to achieve. There is better revenue, better relationships. Nice. At the end of the day, it's a, it's a human to human interaction. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. That's a great summary. Thank you, Grady. And I will see you again for another episode that will be related to no, no code, code AI, AI solution. <laughs> Thank you very much. Beautiful. Have a good one. And I will see you yep. uh, in the next episode. You too, Thank Paul. you. Bye-bye.